Great, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the Data, Business and Industry panel. And uh, in, a, in a change to the advertised billing, we're actually going to kick off with Jennifer Whitson from the University of Waterloo, who's going to be talking about data capital in the games industry. Hi all, thanks for coming. Uh, so, and thanks for hosting such a wonderful event. So this talk is about how big data works and how it doesn't work in games. Um, big data practices arising from the completely unanticipated success of free-to-play Facebook games such as Farmville fundamentally reshaped the entire games industry. Revenue models shifted from retail sales to games as a long-term service premised on advertising revenue and microtransactions. And mobile games exploded. And so because of this success, all game companies now, to some extent or another, are reliant on metrics-driven design. And so from 2012 to 2014, I was embedded with an incubator for small game studios, examining how teams of two to five people were using big data. And especially the tension between the creative autonomy sought by indies, their pursuit to make good games, and their desires for economic stability to escape the precarious gig employment that now is a hallmark of games. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead here. One of the things I was following was how reliance on big data infrastructures was increased despite the fact that the very companies that had introduced and evangelized data-driven design, like Farmville Zynga, were unable to replicate their success with new games. So if big data was failing in the game design domain, what exactly was it good for? So in a nutshell, what do I think it's important for you to know? Um, Solon Barocas, Kate C Crawford, and many others have all demonstrated how algorithms and data simultaneously obscure and replicate discrimination and social inequality. And so my argument is along the same lines, is that once we look to everyday practice, the materiality of data, we discover that the obscuration and replication of discrimination and social inequality occurs in sites of cultural production, such as games. In short, with the democratization of free game design tools and self-publishing platforms, everyone can now make and publish games, subverting traditional gatekeeping in culture industries. But the funding and professionalization of games work, getting paid to make games, depends on new literacies and forms of capital, which very clearly exclude certain people without big data literacies and surveillance resources. And so my contribution here is to document how this exclusion happens, but also show how in the face of extensive resources it demands, there are relatively minor returns for big da data in terms of predicting and shaping player behavior. The value of big data lies elsewhere, not in prediction, but as a filter for funders looking to locate entrepreneurial, business-minded indies in the hundreds and hundreds of new developers. And so I'm going to use Dan's team as an exemplar of this process. And they made a small game that was very well received and integrated about 10 different data services. And so I'm going to describe quickly what that looks like. But first, I want to talk about why indies become entrepreneurs and integrate data practices in the first place. And so developers entered Execution Lab's incubator looking for social capital. They wanted access to the networks of influence with publishers and high profile game mentors and developers generated by one of the founders. And so it's largely sort of the traditional variant of the boys club. And so once accepted to the incubator, they started accessing and accruing social capital, meeting these people, developing expertise that were distinctly entrepreneurial rather than indie flavored, such as PR, biz development, pitching and legal knowledge. Indie artists became indie entrepreneurs, accruing the very specific cultural capital that goes with it. They learned new languages and habitus of which analytics and risk reduction were key, as exemplified in sort of Eric Ree's lean startup discourse in his book. And so developers take these new data literacies and apply them to their development practices. And this stage is what I'm going to unpack in more detail in the rest of the minutes I have remaining. But for most developers I talk to, their measures of making it are linked to having financial and creative freedom for just their next game, to being able to survive without publishers, without investors, without funding agencies. And so indies were taking out big data technologies and discourses in service of securing enough money from funders to one day return to the indie artists, creating the games that garner recognition and accolades, thus finally leading to symbolic capital. 
beyond escaping precarious labor, this was the symbolic capital was what they were seeking in the first place. They just had to appropriate big data and risk logics in order to do so. So what does a circuit of data and capital look like on the ground? How exactly but does big data operate in translating cultural to economic capital? And what do I mean when I mention the failures of big data? And so generally, analytics providers fall into three categories, tracking platform performance, tracking advertising income and expenditures, and tracking player behavior. Tools like App Annie, Dismo, iTunes, Google Play track all of this from how many people are installing the game, where they live, their demographics, how they're reviewing the game, uh, and they're letting developers know who's downloading and paying for the game and how the game is comparing to all the other games on the market. Other tools track ad networks and player acquisition campaigns. Um, and I'm going to skip this part of the talk because I'm hoping that David Nieborg here is going to cover it in his talk uh, later. But mobile games are democratizing in that they require relatively little money to develop. Hundreds of thousands of dollars is the norm. However, they require at least that amount for marketing in terms of acquiring, acquiring players through user acquisition ad campaigns. Enough players are purchased to uh, be featured on the app store's front pages, which are algorithmically determined and so require a critical mass of these paid players immediately upon global launch in order to show up on the screen when folk like us pull out our app store and search for new games. And so finally, the third sort of uh, moment of metrics is in-game data, which is what most game designers are really caring about. They build hooks into their game to collect data, such as whether players get through the tutorial, what levels they play to, where they die, what weapons they use, etc. And so for example, if this is kind of small and you can't really see it, but if a large percentage of players all died in the same place, or worse yet, as in here, never made it past the tutorial level, then um, devs know that they have problems to fix, such as removing a lot of the text boxes that appear in the first one, and thus increasing uh, the people that finish your tutorial from 49% in the first version to 66% in the second, uh, making player actions clearer. Okay, so it's in the day-to-day -day big data practice that replication of social <coughs> inequalities comes in. Everybody can now make and distribute games, but not everybody can work with big data. And I'm going to talk about these uh, new literacies of exclusion right now. Metrics demand technical proficiency to implement and integrate. Three out of five of the people on Dan's team had engineering backgrounds, and so they were able to quickly understand how to use each uh, software development kit that came with these tools like Flurry and integrate them with the APIs that are required for other tools like Facebook's ad tracking. And still, this work took weeks in a very short schedule and required technical knowledge to track the inevitable bugs. So for example, every time the Apple iOS upgraded, um, it wouldn't be compatible with some of the tools and it would crash the whole system. And so then it would take time to locate the problem and figure out how to salvage the corrupted data. Some tools were free, profiting off of the generation of data. However, any advanced tracking required premium accounts, something that Execution Labs was able to negotiate given their economy of scale and resource sharing, uh, but other developers would simply lack. So they wouldn't get the good data or the ways to make sense of the data they were collecting. And so, of course, user acquisition also demands considerable resources, uh, financial resources. Easily $50,000 for even small, uh, new mobile games. Thus, while low production costs free devs from exploitative publishing relationships, new ones are formed in search of these acquisition marketing funds. And without the initial funds to buy users, to generate data, to prove that the game is viable to publishers, to secure even more marketing funding to buy enough users to hit critical mass and get featured on iStores, uh, the development is sunk. And so for example, the game makers that we may know, like Supercell, who make Clash of Clans and Rovio, they uh, spend half a billion dollars each on purchasing these players. And so along with the time spent integrating the analytics services, services uh, we have a human resources filter because developers needed a very specialized, dedicated expert to make sense of all of these different streams of data. And so Execution Labs was able to hire a full-time data analyst and business intelligence specialist to share between the teams. And she spent countless hours cleaning these data, a task that was made impenetrable to outsiders because even though services often use the same terms, uh, minute variations in how they use the terms or even whether they started on a different day of the week uh, meant that any of the data streams wouldn't be comparable with any reliability. 
And so, of course, uh, the time to do this all creates another temporal filter. It's a resource not equally available to all. Directly after featuring, a game's downloads drop precipitously in a matter of hours. Thus, data streams must go through multiple stages of collecting player data, of cleaning the player data, of integrating all the data streams, of making actionable insights to change your design, to make the design changes, and then to uh, making the game updates. And those must be near immediate. And so a new literacy of exclusion based on these filters uh, starts to build up. Devs that are able to take on big data discourses are generally plugged into privileged networks. They have access to financial capital and come from backgrounds in male-dominated and educated education-intensive fields such as engineering. And so not surprisingly, the, the devs that use uh, data are the ones that receive the most monetary support. But the really interesting twist about the failures of big data comes as we dig deeper into Dan's story and trace economic capital. Upon release, Dan's game was, was featured by both Apple and Google Play Store front pages, and it was downloaded hundreds of thousands of times, which is a triumph in a market where 500 plus games are released each and every day. Despite its reviews and download numbers, it was a financial failure. It wasn't able to pay for its over $100,000 in development costs, earning just a few thousand dollars in its highest weeks, because only one out of every thousand players spent any money in it. With access to Dan's weekly data analytics and metrics report, I watched day by day as tens of thousands of players played the game and tens of dollars trickled in in return. I watched the team worked months to implement changes based on the analytics companies that they work with to effectively earn pennies in return for each of these changes. The game still flopped despite the implementation of all the big data tools that promised to take unpredictability and risk out of creative content production. But it also succeeded. Far beyond driving actual design, the data generated of traction and average revenue per user is used to network with and apply to funding agencies and investors. So in Dan's case, he was successful in garnering hundreds of thousands of dollars in financial investment from VCs, development contracts, and government arts funds for the next game. But proving one had data and was data savvy is key in accessing much larger coffers and networks for economic stability. And so economic capital generated from these big data practices is not from improving game playability or making a profitable profit, but solving the filtering issue for investors, publishers, and government funding agencies in determining who out of the hundreds of new studios to fund. And so this is my argument. The champion of data in the games industry solves a filtering problem rather than a prediction problem. Metrics are about reducing risk, but it's not the risk you think of figuring out which games will make money or find and target loyal users. Metrics are useful not in terms of predicting players, but about performing entrepreneurialism and signaling to funders. In Dan's case, securing economic capital was reliant on demonstrating the cultural capital of big data. Using data to prove one's game was profitable was actually not necessary, as each site recognized the unpredictability of the game's market. They more wanted assurances that the devs and their company would be responsible and business savvy investments. And so metrics weren't really used to improve the game, but to prove that the game studio had the necessary cultural markers and values. Um, prioritizing funding and financial growth and traction over other more artistic game devy aspirations. Proving that you're a serious, incredible business rather than just an indie artist. Uh, and so this would reduce the risk to investors, not developers. Um, <coughs> And so the lesson is this. Indie game devs use data in a way that's much more complex and counter to accepted definitions of the value of big data. Rather than predicting future patterns and signaling interventions into player behavior, these devs deploy big data as performance rather than prediction. Big data is important not for what it can tell them about games and players, but as a legitimization discourse and signaling practice in terms of their interactions with the gatekeepers <laughs> and funding agencies that buttress culture industries. And so using metrics in the way I described above, it becomes a tactic of selective citations and reveals that evidence considerable appropriation and reshaping from resistant developers, such as Dan. 
but it's also an insidious strategy that seep into and change these devs as discourse of numeracy become evident in their day-to-day -day practice and seep into their design strategies and shapes their future opportunities. M and many of these opportunities are open to some developers but not others. Being able to talk about big data in the game industry is a very real barrier to entry to certain circles, despite the fact that the actual implementation of these tools doesn't markedly improve the success of your actual game. And so in concluding, I'd like to posit that what's happening here in terms of big data literacies and the curated representation of big data outcomes at Success Theater isn't restricted to these indie games, but takes place much more broadly in informational economies that are increasingly shaped by entrepreneurial and venture labor logics. Effectively, the new literacies and forms of capital that exclude certain people in the games industry are also working on a much broader scale and replicate existing categories of privilege and status. So, these numbers don't mean what we think they mean, but they're really important to study nonetheless. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the title of my talk is All the Homes. Um, it's based on my own close reading uh, of housing data on Zillow.com, which is an online housing and real estate marketplace. Um, and what I want to try to convince you is that Zillow can help us think about what context means in relationship to data um, and why it matters. So I'm going to start with um, is this working? I'm going to start with uh, some words of advice. Uh, now, this isn't my advice to you. This is advice um, I've heard many times. Often, I get this advice from uh, my colleagues in computing. Um, and this, is, this suggestion kind of concerns the design of interfaces to data that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, it seems to, um, it seems uh, re like a responsible you know, piece of advice, even respectful. It honors the data, personifies it even. Um, and, and these days, I kind of hear it everywhere. Um, but I think there are some really important and unexamined implications to this advice that I want to talk about. First, it suggests that data are a are, uh, singular, monolithic entity. And they kind of speak with a singular voice. Um, that they're autonomous somehow. They're kind of acting on their own. Uh, that what data says is self-evident, doesn't really require too much interpretation. And that finally, that data is somehow a marginalized voice, and that design is a tool of empowerment, that we're, that, uh, we're going to kind of let the data free. Um, now, in my experience, these conceptions of data don't actually fit with, um, with uh, our everyday experiences. We rather encounter data as plural and heterogeneous um, through sophisticated mediating interfaces framed by a variety of discourses, even um, advice like this, um, and actually given a privileged place, as we just heard in the last talk, um, in business and science um, and increasingly in, in policy deliberations. Uh, so accepting this advice actually would require us to ignore the ways in which we um, often encounter data. So social scientists will tell us um, to put data in context in response, right? And here is a kind of well-known quote from a, a paper by Boyd and Crawford um, encouraging us to um, retain context, but that it's critical. Data are not generic. Context is hard to interpret at scale and even harder when data are reduced to fit a model. Managing context in light of big data will be an ongoing challenge. So kind of calling out this problem of kind of retaining the context. But often these kinds of statements ignore the fact that contexts aren't neutral. And there are many possible contexts. Context is not just one thing. Um, so I want to talk about um, how we might think about context in relationship to data. And more specifically, how does power operate through context, through the settings in which data are understood. If we think about um, context in a kind of generic sense as a setting in which some kind of event or thing might be fully understood. Um, what does it mean to, to do that for data? Um, now, I'm going to focus on the concrete question of housing data um, and, and, and how housing data is put into context. Um, 
This is an example of, of what I'm talking about when I say housing data. There are lots of different kinds of housing data. This is a listing. Um, you've probably all seen some version of this. This is from Zillow. It has um, you know, a beautiful picture of a house, an address, details about the house, its square footage, its selling price, um, a description of kind of what's been renovated in the house, all kinds of, so all this is part of uh, a kind of data set about this inv individual property and Zillow kind of um, manages millions of these, right? So why housing? Well, first of all, housing is, is a domain that's being fundamentally transformed by kind of increased um, access to data. There's, you know, listings like this have been around for a long time, but they're increasingly accessible through sites like Zillow. Um, and although we had an, an enormous crisis in 2007, 2008 around housing, and rethought a lot of housing practices or other practices related to housing, we haven't really rethought how we use housing data, uh, particularly in the public realm. And Zillow, which is based mainly in the US, is actually the, the biggest of these online marketplaces. And since they started in 2006, kind of in that culture leading up to the crisis, might, might say that they're kind of operating in a, in a way that's kind of complicit with that crisis. And, and that needs to be investigated. Um, and because they're the largest, we also, you know, we might ask, OK, well, is Zillow a successful example of putting data in context? And what does that mean? And, and how do we define success? Um, it's certainly effective in a sense. Um, so my <coughs> approach um, actually takes up an important challenge, I think, defined by critical data studies. Um, um, here's a quote from uh, that paper by K Kitchen and Loria um, from 2014, asking us to unpack the complex assemblages that produce, circulate, share, sell, and utilize data in diverse ways. Um, so I'm interested in how close readings of sites like Zillow can help us do that work of unpacking. Uh, and by close reading, I mean to understand how meaning is produced or conveyed by these, these uh, interfaces. So this is treating data and um, their interfaces as cultural artifacts, but not independent artifacts. Um, so my work is informed by many interviews that I do with experts in housing, um, technologists who work on sites like this, um, researchers in the university, realtors, developers, planners, but also organizers and activists uh, who care about the future of housing, particularly low-cost housing. Um, and this work is also informed by critical technical experiments that I do myself with, with housing data. Um, and all this has helped me to form what I'm calling a, an operational definition of context for data. And that's going to be the focus of the rest of my talk. So my, my notion of operational context actually differs quite a bit from dominant modes of thinking about context in computing. And um, just to save time, um, I'm going to just talk about two ways of thinking about context that Paul Durish has written about extensively in his paper, what we talk about when we talk about context. Um, and these are representational and, and interactional. So the representational, um, on one hand, is a form of, is thinking about context as a form of information, right? Um, that's easily delineable, that's stable, that's separable from the subject itself. Uh, here he writes, context consists of a set of features of the environment surrounding generic activities, and that these features can be encoded and made available to a software system. So it's kind of retrospective view of kind of what was happening at the time. Um, interactional um, is something quite different. Um, it's relative rather than stable. It's dynamic. It's spontaneous. It's something that arises from activity. So in Durish's words, Context isn't something that describes a setting, it's something that people do. Um, so in an interaction with data, they may define the context, right? I actually kind of want to step away from these and ask if we can have what I call a more cultural understanding of context. Uh, uh, Clifford Geertz actually called culture a context for interpretation, right? Uh, so a, a, an operational or a cultural uh, understanding of context would um, involve understanding the analytical, the discursive, the procedural setting 
where data are made accessible, interpretable, and this is most important, actionable. So the context, in my understanding, is not just about kind of understanding the data, but it's also about um, kind of um, getting the data to do to do work for you. Um, asking not not what um, context helps users understand about data, but what it actually enables. Right? Um, it means connecting data to existing social codes, structures, um, material constraints, technological affordances. How do we kind of uh, put the data to work. That's what the context does. So it's not something, it's not a retrospective view, and it's not something that kind of arises in the moment, but it's a kind of system in which the data works. So let's return to the case of Zillow. And just to give you a sense of how Zillow kind of got into real estate and their perspective uh, um, on, on the real estate market, I'm going to read you a little quote from a book called Zillow Talk that uh, Raskoff and Humphreys, the founders of Zillow, um, wrote. They say, uh, shopping for a home is like being in a dark room where only the agent was holding a flashlight. She'd shine it on two or three homes, listings, or comps she'd chosen for you. But all you wanted to do was grab the flashlight and wield it for yourself. Or better still, just flip on the darn light switch and see it all. That's why we created Zillow, to turn the lights on and to bring transparency to one of our country's largest and mo most opaque industries. Um, this is the home page of Zillow, um, or the, the, the kind of search page. Um, and this is the kind of overriding message of um, Zillow's approach to housing data. Data want to be free. Again, sounds laudable, like some kind of emancipatory goal. But much of what Zillow does is actually to create attachments for data, to ground data in specific and very complex operational settings things like a map like this. Now, in a longer paper that I wrote um, that if anyone is interested I can make available, I write about three different dimensions of operational context. One is the analytical setting, um, which it, it, in Zillow's case is this map that actually tries to stimulate new interpretations of location in relationship to home value. Um, another one is the discursive setting. Um, uh, the, which Zillow defines as a kind of personal journey through public space. Remember in the last slide they talk about finding your way home. And then uh, the third one, the one that I'm going to concentrate in the rest of this talk on, um, is what I call the procedural dimension of, of, of Zillow as a context, as a setting that's established by an, uh, uh, an automated valuation model that they call the Zestimate. Um, or Zillow estimate. So this automated valuation model um, is essentially a procedure for trying to triangulate housing values, not just for homes that are on the market, but every house. So you can see all these houses have prices. So um, every property potentially in Zillow's mind has, has a potential market value. Um, it's based on millions of uh, publicly available and user submitted data points, so a lot of very heterogeneous data sets. And it's calculated for about 100 million homes nationwide. So not quite all the homes, but a lot. Um, the, what's interesting about this estimate is the values are actually discarded every night and rebuilt again in the morning based on new data, um, new sales, changing conditions in the market using both general and local rubrics for producing these valuations. Um, so it, it's, it's this kind of running process. And you can, you can kind of check in on the value of your house, according to Zillow, every day. Um, I'd like us to think about this estimate as a kind of um, procedural rhetoric. This is a term that Ian Bogus developed to talk about how games can um, um, make claims as, as kind of systems. Uh, he writes, procedural rhetoric is the practice of using processes persuasively. Right? So it's based on this idea of procedurality, which is the computer's kind of defining ability to execute a series of rules. So the Zestimate, like a persuasive game, uses rules to make claims about how property values operate. It claims not only square footage and the number of bathrooms and bedrooms, but a whole host of actually invisible proprietary characteristics are intertwined with value. Um, we shouldn't see this as a representational system, just kind of 
um, describing a, an existing condition, but rather an operational one that's part of how the mar housing market works, right? Um, the rules are proprietary, but owners can interact with them. They can update facts about their homes, that kind of thing. Um, now, this estimate is actually this estimate is actually wrong most of the time. <laughs> Um, it, it, it's only within 5% of the sale value about half of the time. But, um, uh, and actually there's an ongoing context to improve this. Um, but actually it might not matter because Zillow doesn't make money based on whether their estimate is right or not. They make money from, uh, by connecting you to realtors and other professionals who actually advertise on their site who kind of pay to keep them in business. So the real goal of Zillow is to kind of connect you to these professionals and not necessarily <coughs> um, uh, to predict, accurately predict the value of your home. So I just want to try to wrap up. I know I'm running out of time. Um, so if we are to unpack data assemblages, that means in part trying to kind of take apart data in context and understand that there are kind of multiple alternative contexts for thinking about data, not just the way that Zillow presents it. So we might think about, um, you know, in, in terms of other contexts for how sales data can be used or listings can be used. They can be put at a timeline <laughs> to um, try to understand how we got to now, how the market got to now. Um, they can be put in the context of other discourses on displacement, on gentrification, on ongoing movements. Um, about keeping housing affordable, um, or the kind of procedural context of um, housing rules and regulations that dictate how the market works. Um, so I'll just end there. Um, uh, I hope I've left you with some reasons to uh, kind of continue to question not just data, but actually also its analytical, discursive, and procedural context. Thank you. Fantastic. So, um, what I want to present today um, perhaps has not much to do with um, um, what uh, this panel has uh, to, um, to is approaching, um, but uh, to some extent, I would like to um, just uh, put there some ideas of something that is still work in progress. Okay. Um, so, just. To give you a little bit of background in terms of where do I come from uh, when it comes to this specific argument, um, I managed to have uh, uh, a fantastic opportunity to talk to a number of data journalists working in the UK, in the United Kingdom. Um, and I published this paper um, last year um, where I tried to see whether journalists were able to hold accountable what I called you know, an emerging uh, breed of data brokers, you know, namely Facebook, Google, um, all these organizations that we have been demonizing for a long time. So, um, I have collected two really interesting um, arguments. You know, I really find out that it was not the case, that data journalists never felt they were responsible for holding these organizations accountable. Um, you have uh, two statements there, one says there's a difference between data being the story or the issue in data-driven journalism, which can apply to whatever the subject matter. So they, they, they had a, a some sort of more instrumental approach to data uh, than, than in terms of the topic that data um, was talking about. So based on that idea, I wanted to try to approach this um, in a more systematic and applied way. So those were the, the kind of research questions that I tried to, to, to approach. It was understand how profoundly data is embedded in the structures of public bodies, governments, corporations, and civic society overall. Try to see these as a, as a network, as a map. Um, examine the role of, of journalists as watchdogs of data for institutions. And this is the capacity of journalists to recognize how effectively data governs the quantification of the world. Quite ambition, ambitious uh, tasks. So. Um, I was inspired by uh, a project that was funded by the Knight Foundation um, a while ago called uh, Poderopedia. And this um, is a really, really interesting um, initiative uh, driven by data journalists that try to link different organizations from Chile, Colombia, and, and, and Venezuela, uh, politicians working in the office with, um, you know, uh, th you know they're kind of trying to, uh, to trace the, how Business is, is run and, and how is, is politics influenced by that. 
and they present really interesting maps, um, really interesting networks of, of relationships. So, um, and my quest to determine a methodological approach to, to, to this, um, one of the, of the perhaps most challenging aspects was basically parametrizing data power, how we can actually just uh, use the, the old conceptual uh, abstractions that we have made on, in terms of what data power means and, and make it work for, for something that is basically just a computational um, infrastructure. Um, I had to also understand in the relation, uh, relational uh, peculiarities of the network, how this network wor was going to work on. Uh, um, and I need to identify the nodes and the attributes. Just imagine in society how difficult it's just to see all the different actors uh, working um, and, and when it comes to data transactions. And then was assigning values that were, you know, um, uh, were going to give me a, a relevant measurement of, of, of data power. Um, so when it came to parametrizing um, data power index, um, I tried to do it this way. I, I tried to see all these different variables from all the literature that's been published on, 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 on data um, power. And um, I assign an, a, a series of, of, you know, basically a, a numerical scale. Um, so it has to do with who holds data and the size of the data stores, who can access data, uh, who gains insight from data, who gains financial value from data, who generates data, uh, who uses or who, who is able to influence based on, on their on their um, their knowledge or their um, session of data. They who gatekeeps data and who understands data power. When it comes to understanding the relational peculiarities of the network, I saw clearly two types of relation uh, relations. One was uh, relational events, and it has to do with interactions between actors, and the other one was the flow of data, how you know data move from one node to the other. And then I thought it was interesting to, to try to find out a little bit of, of, about you know relational cognition. It was basically who were was more data power, power than you know who was more power in terms of, of data uh, in the network, who had more power. Uh, node identification was really challenging. Uh, you have a huge list, and this was basically just narrowed down to the United, United Kingdom, obviously, as you can see. Um, so all those different actors, one way or another, have a relationship with data. They, they, they either use data, they access data, or they produce data. Um, so we have data brokers, and, and in terms of data brokers, I, I basically just approach those four usual suspects. Um, there are a number of intermediaries uh, that work normally quite closely with those data brokers. Then you have a series of different branches of the, of the national and regional and, and local governments, intelligence agencies, obviously, public bodies, third sector organizations, private companies that somehow cater for data, adv advertisers, citizens, grassroots initiatives, academia, and obviously the media. Um, and that has nothing to do still yet with uh, Internet of Things companies that are basically what I think is going to come up after this. Um, assigning values was a tricky one. Um, and that has to do with um, the way in which I wanted to really measure those interactions. So interactions, I tried to see what were the strong weak ties. Uh, in terms of flows, I basically just set it as a directed um, uh, network. And then relational cognition was basically uh, based on an 11-point uh, scale, um, and perhaps just also considering the shortness of the paths in the, net, in the network. It was my data power index. Um, you can see clearly each one of the, of, the, of the nodes, and then the measurements, the different uh, aspects that I, I, I thought were um, able to be measured. And then you have the different values that I assigned to each one of them. Uh, just uh, briefly, an example of my edge and node lists. Um, those were uh, basically, you can see um, a mean of data power and, and the index, and then a description of, of, their, of their involvement, or, um, and then you can see the different edges and the where directed. So that was the baby. <coughs> um, I want to really stress this works really as illustrative example. This is not, by any means, it's not um, a, a, an, um, 
in, in its last stage, in the finished state. Uh, but it's interesting just to see uh, how um, the network relations were um, in terms of data power. So let me just go there to try to make sense of things. <coughs> you can see clearly two uh, clusters. That one cluster has pretty much to do with what I call the, the traditional political arena, arena, or, or you know, uh, where you have obviously uh, private companies working alongside a number of different uh, government institutions, public bodies, the media, um, academia here, um, and then you have two intermediary uh, companies that uh, in the United Kingdom tend to work with uh, the government. Then you have a little node here which represents the citizens. And as you can see, this connects both uh, clusters. Um, additionally, you have this one, which um, I think really well represents uh, what uh, we tend to call data brokers. And uh, uh, the centrality of advertisers is clear in this, in this, in this cluster. Uh, you can see then that um, you have Facebook, Google, Fitbit, and Amazon, and how closely they are related to the intermediaries they work with, you know, companies that pretty much use gather data and then process data for them. Interestingly enough, you can see how far detached media is from that cluster. Um, um, the index, the power index, pretty much represented by the size of the node, um, is quite evident as well. Quite small when it comes to civic society and grassroots initiatives when it, um, of civic society. Um, quite big when it comes to the GCHQ, um, this is the intelligence services of, of the United Kingdom. Uh, rather small when it comes to uh, local or regional government, third, so third sector organizations here, uh, and other uh, um, public bodies. Private companies still quite central um, um, and, and in terms of their um, influence in, 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 in governments. But interestingly enough, they are quite detached from all this. Um, so you can see that these uh, uh, institutions, these nodes, are also quite prominent in terms of how much power they hold. Um, so everything seems to go uh, to citizens from this end in terms of the flow of, of data. Uh, pretty much because um, in the United Kingdom, through a Freedom of Information Act request, uh, citizens can access um, uh, data from, from the public domain. Interestingly enough, that data is not relevant in terms of increasing the power because they uh, perhaps don't have the data literacy required to make sense or gain insight from that data. Um, private companies are still quite, um, um, they quite still use that. Um, but you can see that all the data that goes from citizens uh, is used by these companies. Um, and the betweenness between these um, quite pretty much um, shows how the relationship between uh, data brokers and intermediaries are, are basically uh, quite strong. So this um, this much more and more systematically insight um, to extract from that uh, from that um, network uh, representation for, for the sake of time, I will just um, leave a few comments for discussion. Um, in the first instance, I think that data creates an intricate, uh, an intricate network of interactions and flows that reinforces technocratic power structures. You can still see, if I go back to the network, that it is companies that has to do with the, the technology, the ones that hold more power when it comes to data, obviously. Um, uh, Media are clustered in a normative political arena, far detached from the datocratic arena. Um, and civic society was far, f uh, was a far the most deprived set of nodes, which pretty much reinforces many of the of the of the discussions that we will have in, in, in here when it comes to data inclusion. Um, so, to some extent, if you consider um, the 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 findings of these, um, I'm still quite skeptic uh, about the perspective of you know, gaining, gaining power, uh, data power from the bottom up. Um, and that is something that we have, um, we have seen in uh, our current research project that we are running 
uh, uh, where we worked uh, with each one, representation of each one of these nodes um, in our research network called Lightning Data. If you want to check what we're doing, um, um, that's the link. So that's, that's me. Thank you very much. Everybody, it's uh, really nice to uh, to be here, uh, be a part of a conference that uh, my uh, new colleague uh, Tracy is putting on, and it looks like she's done a bang up job so far. So mm -hmm. it's nice to see a nice uh, room here. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is, you know, big data requires big infrastructures to get from uh, one place to another, and we have some stories about those uh, infrastructures and where they're located, and so on and so forth. Uh, who owns and controls them, and uh, their purposes and so on and so forth, and I think it's time for us to do a little bit of a recheck uh, on uh, the ownership control geography of the internet infrastructure uh, as it now exists. The shark was meant to show the materiality of uh, communication infrastructures. Sharks sometimes try to eat the cables that account for 99% of all of the uh, international uh, internet traffic flows around the world. Um, so it's a nice way to get at that, I think. So, you know, I think we have a common story that uh, we find throughout the literature and, you know, I think maybe at one time it made some sense, but I'm going to show you some data that suggests that less and less the story that we tell about the internet and its ownership and control doesn't correspond uh, very well with reality. And so I think the basic story is that, you know, starting in the 1990s, we had a particular kind of globalization that was essentially the globalization of the American uh, form of capitalism, the American form of the Internet, and the American form of the regulation and uh, trade regime for uh, telecommunications. The old multilateral regime that had been hosted around the United Nations, specialized agencies like the ITU was skirted uh, in favor of an international trade regime under the World uh, 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 Trade uh, Organization. Uh, we had the multi-stakeholder model of uh, internet uh, government governance and there is a tendency for policies adopted in the United States to be exported around the world and emulated with maybe a, perhaps a few tweaks in countries around the world and this was the same for internet uh, governance, for telecommunications and for uh, copyright policy and so some people talked about policy imperialism that went along with the ownership and control of the information infrastructure. Of course, we have GAFA, FANG, or whatever kind of derogatory uh, acronym that you like to give to the, you know, the, the, the internet uh, behemoths. Um, and of course, people have unpacked the idea of the State Department's internet freedom agenda as the kind of the legitimating uh, 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 political international relations framework for the kind of American economic dominance of the Gang of Four. Um, and of course the Snowden disclosures kind of suggest to us that, wow, the United States can just like tap in to all of the world's cables given its complete dominance of, uh, uh, of the internet infrastructure. Um, but I think these claims are really, really overblown. And I think they're overblown in ways that resonate with historical ways of talking about global communication since its development from the 1850s onwards in the submarine cable telegraph uh, networks. And we have this kind of realist model that comes to us from international relations in which power resides in states and there is typically a dominant global hegemon. It was Pax, America, or Pax Britannica. Uh, in the 19th century and sometime in the 20th century, either after First World War or Second First World War, pick your uh, theorist, you know, Pax Britannica uh, was replaced by Pax Americana and the Ameri you know, United States was the hegemon. Um, but I think what we're seeing, uh, right, well, first of all, I, I think that's a, a problematic model, this idea of single pole uh, international order. I think there's a lot more kind of collaboration and a kind of a shared hegemony, uh, if you will, at the basis of international relations. 
But even if we took that model, the U.S. Uh, standing in the world is in decline. It's increasingly being displaced by uh, Europe and the BRICS countries, uh, in particular China. And we certainly don't have stability as the foundation of the world order today. We have, if not anything else, instability. And my real key point here is, sure, if we look at some of the kind of the, the middleware and the top level content service and applications, yes, we can find the dominance of American companies. But if we look at the, you know, who owns the guts and the gears, the actual cable infrastructures, the internet exchange points, the content distribution networks, uh, um, the a ASN, ANs, the autonomous numbered systems, Right? We find that there's a great shift of the guts and the gears outside of the United States uh, into other countries around the world. And this re reflects a shifting kind of geopolitical economy of the world. And I forgot to stop, uh, start my clock. Uh, so we have this old model of telling stories. Uh, and I call, it for the I call it the struggle of control of global communications uh, model. And it has several characteristics. Um, and it's, it's used historically to explain development of global communications and still used today. It assumes that national and corporate interests are very closely coupled. Well, you know, let's just think about uh, Apple and uh, opening up uh, uh, it, it's the data for uh, the FBI as a way in which we don't see uh, close coupling. And there are other ways. Um, historically, the idea was that you had the largest cable company in the world, the Eastern Extension, uh, and Associated Telegraph Companies and Reuters made Britain the hub of the global communication system. And that communications were really kind of tools of empire used to consolidate the control of powerful states over uh, geography. And basically the geography of communication was seen as being the geography of empire. Turn of the 20th century, we increasingly had conflict, inter-imperial uh, rivalry, uh, engaging Britain in a struggle for control of global communications, and eventually Britain's you know, Pax Britannica was eclipsed by Pax Americana. It's a nice tidy story, um, but I think it's really, really flawed. For one, I mean, it's an excessive focus on politics, imperialism, endless war and strife. And we have to ask ourselves, where is business? Where is technology? Where's the capital investment that became primarily, I mean, over 90% from private interests, okay? Where is that? So what we have here is a one-sided uh, theory of territorial imperialism. I think we need to bring in uh, David Harvey's idea of capitalist imperialism, and bring the two together, and see that we have much more of a cooperative kind of set of arrangements between state actors, between private actors, underpinned by knowledge that cr tries to create a system of power that develops an overall or a universal space of economic development and uh, capital accumulation. Power is not to preserve a single states, but as I said, it is much more cooperative in nature. We have the emergence perfectly in the 19th century of multilateral organizations, the ITU being the, one of the uh, earliest ones. And states are in no way just the simple handmaidens of capital, and neither are capitals, uh, or is capital the simple handmaiden of uh, states. The relationships sometimes are collaborative, sometimes they are in conflict and tension. So the empire of capital and development of general purpose global information infrastructures is the way I think we need to uh, look at things. There's a kind of a way in which we see general purpose networks or infrastructures develop that is synchronized with financial crises. If we look at the work of Carlotta Perez, for example, or uh, 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 Robert Gordon in the United States, we see that the development of major infrastructures, especially information infrastructures, are somehow kind of coincide with financial bubbles and uh, speculative excesses and then crises. The early phases in this is technological failures, a decade or so of technological failures that is then uh, displaced by, oh, we know the technology and now we can start really building things out on a more permanent basis as opposed to experimental model. Capital comes rushing in, good projects become, distance, uh, become undistinguishable from bad projects, 
and the, there's a speculative frenzy around the project, and there's fraud at the core, and what happens is we get these speculative bubbles, and they collapse. Interestingly enough, at the two major phases of developments of modern capitalist information infrastructure, the 1870s with the development of global submarine telegraph cables, and in the late 1990s, turn of the 20th century, with the development of the global internet infrastructure, we get financial crises. Again, check out Carlotta Perez's work on this, but there's a really great literature that I think is underdeveloped. I'm going to try to go quick by this. This basically just goes over the model historically, but let's kind of go ahead to look at the stuff uh, more contemporarily and just say, uh, wow, we're going to go a lot faster uh, here um, because I just got the five uh, minute uh, uh, mark here. So, um, you know, all which is to say that, in, uh, let me just move on. Uh, so, uh, there's a kind of a basic similarity in the geography today of the uh, global internet infrastructure and the geography of the uh, uh, submarine uh, telegraphs that were laid down in the 19th and early uh, 20th century. It's also quite remarkable that, you know, there's like 356 cables. That's all. That's it. I mean, 356 cables around the world that account for, you know, all the international internet traffic. That's not a lot. Right. Um, it's about 1.3 million uh, uh, kilometers in length, and as I said, 99% of traffic flows over this small number of cables. One single fiber pair in a cable, and these cables typically have a dozen or 15 or so uh, uh, fiber pairs in them, carries all of, or can carry all of the traffic of all of the world's geosynchronous satellites. Okay, one fiber pair in one cable that typically has 15 or so pairs, and there's 356. So we can see how you know capacious the uh, the material, the wired infrastructure is compared to the wireless uh, infrastructure. Turn of the 21st century, we had this remarkable boom in capital flowing in and the development of the cable, so much so that there was a glut in the transatlantic uh, market, and there's been no new cables built across the transatlantic market since 2000. And three. Here we can see the kind of periodicity, the great spike, right, and then the collapse of uh, of the uh, investment in the submarine cables. We can see it starting to grow over here, and all of this growth is taking place outside of the transatlantic region. As I said, because there's not been no cables laid there since 2003. What we're seeing is the migration of capital and cables and capacity to Asia over through to Africa as well, down to South America, and so on, everywhere else except for the United States. The resurgence of capital is focused in on the BRICS countries. There's four major Asian systems. The Sub-Saharan Africa now is being wired up like nobody's business, uh, as well as the Middle East and Europe. Uh, there are two new cables between North and South America. If we look at the major Asian projects, what we see, we do see Google, Facebook there. Right? But look, at, they're all aside major national telecom uh, operators, as well as some of the new rival uh, competitive telecom operators and the mobile wireless companies. They are most certainly not dominant in this configuration by any means. Here's a map of the world's cable systems, uh, if we look today. And so all of this is kind of new that's taking place. And this is the redundancy is being greatly uh, expanded in those uh, areas. Who made that map? Pardon me? Who made that map? Uh, that's from uh, Telegeography. Okay, I'd be happy to send you uh, a share. Telegeography is an amazing source. It's also extraordinarily expensive. All right, uh, we'll talk about that later. So the geography of the global internet is tilting away for the U.S. Um, the infrastructure is very complex. It has all these other components to it. And once we start looking at the, you know, kind of the guts and gears, we can see this. Here's a, a mapping out of over time of the traffic. I mean, initially, you know, at the high point, around 50% uh, of all traffic, international traffic, internet traffic, went through the United States. It's now half that amount, all right? And the rest of the world is picking up. Let's take a look at the autonomous systems number. Same thing, close to 60% of all of the networks that make up the network of networks that make up the internet used to be in the United States. Whew. 
we're now down to half that amount. And if we look over here, we can see it's the US and it's the BRICS countries that are rising to take the place. Same in terms of the demography of uses. This used to be flipped. This used to be back in, say, 1998, this was North America, right? And Asia would have been to 10%. It's completely flipped now. So the entire kind of uh, materiality and demography of the internet is being changed uh, greatly. Um, I think we're seeing a bit of a post-American internet. Of course, we shouldn't ignore the fact that U.S. companies do dominate at some layers, as I said, the content apps and services uh, layers and some of the middle level uh, layers. Um, but some countries, and huge countries, China, Russia, Korea, to a lesser extent Japan, their presence is very, very uh, minimal. There's also been a growth of uh, a return of the state uh, with regulators exploding around the world. Uh, this is not the age of the free market. This is the age of the construction of a market-based order. The number of regulators around the world soared 14 in 1990 to 166. Now, national broadband planning. So there's a lot of state market uh, interaction at place here. Of course, we have the, the reinvigorated uh, national security state that Snowden's disclosures uh, 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 show. But he also showed that the U.S. was working in tandem with other countries, the Five Eyes, as well as other countries outside of the Five Eyes, including France, Sweden, and others. So this is a, you know, a, a much more multilateral uh, organize, uh, or organizational framework than uh, uh, we've thought about in the past. Thank you.